Good afternoon. My name is Leah Shobe. Um, I am a member of the uh, Technical Council, uh, so I'm part of the technical leadership, and I work for AMD. And I'm going to be presenting with um, Eli, and he is from uh, NGD Systems, which actually uh, their main product is computational storage. So we're both going to try to talk to you about uh, what we've been doing with the, with the work group and some of the architectures that we've been working with. So how many folks here are actually familiar with uh, computational storage? How many of you have actually heard about computational storage in past, outside of today? Okay, okay, fair amount of you. So um, this overview should help you understand a little bit more about what we're doing and where we're going. So we're going to cover uh, in the agenda, we're going to talk about uh, an introduction to computational storage, and then we'll cover an introduction to what we're doing in the technical work group, and then um, I'm going to have Eli go over some uh, architecture and use cases and where we are in thinking about where uh, this fits in the taxonomy of storage and compute. This isn't something new. This is something that, that's been around for a while. Um, it's been talked about. It, this is, these are examples of, of areas and research where folks have been talking about it for over the past decade. Um, but now is, seems to be the right time to actually pull it together. We have the right technologies to pull together. We got the right um, speed in our processors and the types of processors. And, and now those processors are getting shrunk down to sizes that fit well with bringing uh, compute closer to storage. Uh, also with storage, now we're dealing with new technologies. We have persistent memory. We have NAND technologies. Um, and so being able to put these closer together uh, technologically has been easier now than it has been before. But this idea has been mushrooming for a while. And storage hasn't changed much in its architecture. I don't know how many of you have been in the, art, in the storage industry for a while, but I know I've been in it a long time. And um, it pretty much looks the same. You know, we, we have a, some kind of uh, central controller or processing unit for some type of intelligence to manage our storage. Uh, and then we have the actual storage media. Um, and this is the process that we have carried through from tape to, uh, to uh, NAND technologies. And uh, so it, it's something that is, is kind of a basic core. And so how can we take something that we have um, had that's mainly unchanged and be able to take that to the next level um, and be able to do more in a shorter period of time by bringing those two uh, components together. Just with the evolution of the research and what companies have done, um, so there have been companies in the past that have worked on this, that have initial products uh, in, in R&D that have tried to pull this together in early stages. Um, and so the basic principles of what they were trying to do is something that we can build on today and actually create a standard around. Um, it's not something that was well understood before, but now it seems to be um, more understood with a critical mass of companies, both storage and compute companies, to be able to make this happen. And just to let you know, this isn't going to impact um, you know, what we've done in the hierarchy, you saw Michael show the hierarchy of storage. We're not adding um, to that stack, we're actually complementing that stack. Um, so we're trying to fit in in a certain area uh, where computational storage makes sense within the existing stack and the existing um, uh, uh, technologies that we have today. So what? So what progress have we made uh, as a technical work group since we just got started? Uh, things moved kind of at a lightning speed uh, since we did get started. And um, we've had uh, lots of participation. We have um, 43 participating companies globally 
that are working on this, standardizing this and what this looks like and what the construct look, looks like. As you notice, um, all the major processor companies are involved along with the storage companies and systems companies that are interested in how this fits in their platforms. I know for, for us at, at AMD, we're not only looking at how this fits as a new architecture with our um, client platforms and with our servers, but we're also looking at how does this fit in with our graphics products? Um, because this is something that, that's very, very important um, for gaming. So we're looking at that whole use case as well. So it's not just uh, 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 platforms, but also things like graphics cards. And so our initial focus is basically defining a global definition of what is computational storage. Everybody kind of has an idea of what they think it is, but we need to come together with a universal language. So just, just as interoperability, we have to come with a common language in order to be able to, um, to, to bring all of our products together. We also have to speak that language as well. So we have to start at the beginning so that we're able to com actually communicate with each other and understand each other um, before we're able to get started. So we spent a lot of time in that area. The main focus areas that we were looking at, um, we needed to prioritize the industry. What's important to you? Um, and, and prioritize that so we can work on um, the most common uh, use case first uh, and work our way down. Um, and that involves uh, making sure that we have stand, we utilize and if we need to create uh, standard interfaces and protocols, um, try to leverage as much in exis, ex, excuse me, existing standards as we, ha as we have today. And we need to do that in order to be able to bring this timely to market. If we try to create a new protocol from scratch, number one, the adoption curve for that's going to take a very long time. And number two, it's yet just one more thing that our end users have to use and have to learn. And we don't want to uh, go down that path. So we're trying to utilize um, existing as much as we can. And that involves also aligning with the industry. So we're also aligning with what other standards bodies are doing in order to bring this new technology uh, to market. We also look at uh, education. So we need to promote, just like we are today, and educate folks about what computational storage really is. And so I think that the more we can uh, get uh, architects thinking about what this means, uh, I think we'll get some really, really interesting products in the end out of this. As Michael mentioned, earlier, uh, coming up with a uniform definition in what this means, um, and, and talking about the two constructs. Because you have the device itself, which is the hardware, what does the hardware architecture look like? And then you have to talk about the services, which is you know, your APIs, your software. How does it communicate to your operating system? How does your operating system prioritize tasks that can go to computational storage so they can take back its cycles. You know, for example, when we're looking at the graphics cards, um, one thing that we wonder about is, for example, I, I have a friend of mine and he does animation for TV shows. So any TV show you're watching and you see boulders falling off of a, off of a cliff, he does those things. Well, it takes him a while to get those things done. And, and the reason why it takes him so long is because once he's designed what that's going to look like, he's got a lot of rendering work that has to get done in the background. Well, that eats up CPUs in his workstations and in his servers. And so then he has to go off and get some coffee, go out to dinner. And when he gets back, if that rendering looks right, then he can move on. If it doesn't, he has to do it again. Well, wouldn't it be nice if he was able to take all those rendering tasks and push it off to computational storage devices so he can move on to his other work, so he can be more productive? 
And so therefore, he's able to, he's independent. So then he's able to make more money. He's able to take on more projects. This is something that's, that is, that can cause a lot of um, increased productivity in a lot of areas. So it's just something to think about. So I am going to pass everything off to Eli, and he's going to talk about use cases and architectures. OK, thank you, Leah. Uh, so let me uh, continue the, uh, uh, the presentation on uh, computational storage. Maybe as a side note, so when, when we started this uh, uh, twig on SNIA, we met at the Flash Memory Summit in 2018. A few companies at the industry viewed as competitors because each one of us presented ourselves as a computational storage. But we didn't look at each other as competitors because we understood that we're tackling the same problem from a different angle. So it was very important for us to get together and get, get a home to create standards for uh, computational storage. And luckily, found, we found the SNIA and they created this working group. So today in the market, there are four different types of computa computational storage devices that exist. And let, the, let me walk you through them. So the first one is you have an FPGA connected to a bridge, and that bridge is connected to a bunch of SSDs. And all of that is in one package. The second one is you have an FPGA that is connected directly to an SSD. Right? And the, the purpose of both of those FPGAs is to, to be the processor, to actually conduct the, the computational storage function on the devices. The third option is an FPGA and RAM that sits on the fabric, on the PCIe bus, that is doing a, just the processing work. So there is no storage media. There is no NAND on that card. Even though it just looks like an, like an SSD, it might be in a UDA2 or, or an edge card form factor, but, but there is no storage inside. It just sits along the SSDs to take the workload off the SSDs. And then last and not least is an SOC solution that contain not just the SOC for the SSD device, but also the computational storage part. So a CPU on an on a, on a SOC can provide different functionality than an FPGA. And all these products have viable solutions out in the market, and it's important that the, the tweak will cover all of them. Uh, so we all, all have a, a good use cases to show. So when we look at the bigger picture and how a system with one socket or a few sockets is dealing with those computational storage devices, uh, we can distinguish between them. The first one is the, is the computational storage device that contains both storage and processing unit. The second one is a computational storage processor. So this is a card that just has the processing capability no storage media, no NAND. And the third one is a computational storage array. So here you have a, a, the processing unit sitting behind a bunch of either standard SSDs or computational storage SSDs and communicating to, uh, to the host. So all of these have to, uh, to coexist together for a system that may deploy one to all of them uh, in the same uh, architecture. So uh, once we have the actual hardware for the computational storage, now, now let's talk about the services that computational storage can offer. And we try to bucketize them into two main groups. The first one is the fixed computational storage services, and the second one is the programming. So on the fixed one, you have a, a, a well-defined purpose that can be a compression, decompression, encryption, RAID, that is done on the computational storage. So the system knows that this car, this uh, device, is now helping on a particular uh, operation. It's a fixed uh, type of service. The other one is the, the programming model. So it's a programming co a computational storage service. And some of the examples here, you can run a container or image of an operating system or an application and keep changing the purpose of that service in the system. So you may start by running a container, then you may change by running a one application and then another application, and the host can recognize those services 
knowing that the computational storage device can provide those services to the system. So the type of work that, the, that the SNIA does is looking at the, these services and trying to determine what will be the communication between the host and the drive. So from a management perspective, discovery. The host sees the computational storage device. Now, how, how does the host know that it is a, a computational storage device and not just a standard SSD? Uh, how does the host know to configure the drive to do what they want to do? And how can the host monitor and get all the telemetric from the device? Uh, there should be standards on how that is done. Another aspect is security. So authentication, encryption, auditing, all those computational storage services that are now done need to be part of the encryption and security uh, scheme of the system as a whole. And the last one is the operation. So as the uh, uh, drives are being deployed, uh, the mechanism on how the device is, is running the application and storing the device needs to be defined. So a few examples. And uh, tomorrow, I know that we have at least one track on computational storage. I know that in the uh, uh, SDC in San Jose back in November, we had a full day with tracks only on computational storage from the morning until, until the end of the day. So there's a lot of uh, 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 data and presentation out there on the SNEA website if you are interested to learn more. So a couple of examples. One for uh, fixed uh, computational storage services and for fixed. We have an example of compression that the only thing that the, the computational storage devices can do is compress through the system and database a, a filter through the computational storage services. So those are the only two things that, the, that uh, the CDS can do. And the other example is with a, a programming uh, services is either loading an image of an operating system or uh, taking a, con a container and running it inside the, the SSD. So just, these are just high-level examples of the differences between the fix and the programming uh, services that uh, we offer. So uh, in summary, a computational storage is real. There are a, a several customers with existing solutions that are shipping products to customers. Uh, we see great interest in the market with the technology with the whole idea of, of the, taking the compute and moving it to the storage where the data resides. Uh, and as data will grow and continue to grow in the future, at the edge with 5G and IoT and in the cloud, we think that more and more computational storage use cases will be uh, uh, coming up. Uh, uh, the standardization is now in full swing through SNIA. And uh, one of the most uh, critical items at this stage is really to educate and put the word out there about the capabilities of computational storage. I think that's it. <laughs>